Thank you very much. I trust you can hear me. I'm going to ask Ezekiel if I can share my screen and uh, we'll do that quickly. But it's my privilege to be with you again at uh, Bethany Chapel in Yonkers, New York. And it's uh, a privilege through the medium of Zoom to come to you and to minister the word of God to you. And I'm going to invite you to uh, take your Bibles and uh, turn with me to uh, the book of Philippians, Philippians and chapter one. So we want to we want to think a little bit about the book of Philippians in these next two weeks that I'm with you, and uh, as many of you know, Philippians is one of the prison epistles of the Apostle Paul. It um, Philippians, along with Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, are the prison epistles, and uh, I think uh, the Philippian book. Of course, many of many believers uh, love this book. Uh, dearly, it's a, a book of 100, 104 verses, four chapters, and uh, so many tremendous things in this book. And uh, so we, we're going to look at it at the next two, two uh, Tuesday nights with you. But um, one of the first things, um, I know you probably can't see in the map, but right on the, the edge of Macedonia, uh, you have the little town uh, of Philippi. And uh, it was a relatively small town in the days of the Apostle Paul. And an assembly was started there. And it's one of the, the I think, of the prized uh, assemblies of God's people for the Apostle Paul. He, he, uh, he values the believers very, very much. He praises them uh, very much. And he has a close relationship to them. And uh, we're going to look at this passage tonight, I just want we're gonna we're gonna read a number of verses in a few minutes. But um, I, first of all, I, I just want to uh, look at some general observations, and then we will uh, read in the the scriptures. The name, the Lord Jesus, the Lord, or Christ, or Jesus, is mentioned sixty times in one hundred and four verses. And I think that alone is a tremendous truth. And um, I think it shows you the thinking of the Apostle Paul. And it shows us the thinking of uh, every, what, what, every, what the thinking should be for every believer. That the Lord Jesus Christ should be center and, and up, up, uppermost in our minds, in our ministry, in our thoughts. As we encounter problems, as we seek to serve, as we seek to worship, whatever it may be in the Christian life that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is uppermost in the life of the believer. 60 times in 100, it's almost impossible. It's almost if you tried to do that yourself as you are writing uh, a letter or writing something. It's just amazing how often the name, 20 times uh, in chapter one, uh, roughly 20 times in chapter one, you have the name of the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned. Joy is mentioned 18 times. Uh, thinking and forgetting, and let this mind be in you, and remembering and being like-minded. Uh, all, all of the, the, the act of the mind um, is mentioned uh, many, many times uh, in this epistle, and, uh, and then it's written about 64 AD. Well, let's, let's take our Bibles. I'm going to open in prayer, and then just a short prayer. I know Ezekiel did that already, but I'm going to pray again. Our God and Father, we thank you for this time together, and we pray your blessing and your leading and your guidance, Father, as we uh, as we look at this portion of God's word. And so we pray that and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, begin at verse one, and uh, we'll read a number of verses together. We're not going to look at this whole this whole chapter, uh, but we are going to uh, look at the first the first seven or so. Uh, of verses seven or eight verses of the chapter. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, and the bishops, with the bishops or with the elders, and with the deacons, grace be to you and peace from God our Father 
and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now and being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. As it is right for me to think of you all, because I have you in my heart in as much both in my bonds and in, my, and, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of my grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long after all of you in the tender mercies of Jesus Christ. As we look at verse one of this chapter, we see right away four, four different groups of people that the Apostle Paul writes about. He writes about himself, uh, but he says that they are servants of Jesus Christ. And what a tremendous title. Let me mention all four of them for a minute. The servants of Jesus Christ, the saints, and to all the saints in Christ Jesus, or at Philippi, and the elders and the deacons. Four tremendous groups of people that without which um, the local church could not function. Without the servant leadership, that we would have in a local church. The church could not function properly without the saints. Of course, the saints are the local church. The church is in a building but it's made up of a number of, of saints, uh, those who are believers in the Lord Jesus. Now, I have a Schofield reference Bible, and I encourage you, if you're looking for a study Bible, you could do no better than um, look at the Schofield reference Bible. Allow me to give you the uh, the definition of a church that Mr. C.I. Schofield uh, gives in his Bible. I think it's excellent. I don't know if I've read anything better uh, than this anywhere. He says this, the local church was an assembly of professed believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, living for the most part in one locality, who meet together in his name for baptism, the Lord's Supper, worship, praise, prayer, fellowship, testimony, in the ministry of the word, the discipline, and the furtherance of the gospel. Every such local church has Christ as its center. It is a temple of God. It is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. In organization, a local church is to be called, composed with saints and elders and deacons. So you see... Uh, these three groups of people, I think is so telling and so important that when Paul writes about himself, he calls, him, he calls himself and, and Timothy servants, servants of Jesus Christ. You know, that term servant is used 800 times in the Bible. David calls him, himself a servant, a servant of God, a servant of, of the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the Old Testament 50 times. Moses refers to himself over 40 times. Uh, Joshua refers to himself as a servant of God. Some of the great leaders in the Old Testament refer, the, refer to themselves as servants. When you come to the New Testament, we find, we find of course, the Lord Jesus gives a great passage uh, in, in Mark's Gospel chapter, uh, chapter 10 and, uh, and verse 45 actually verse 42 through verse 45. And in those verses, he, he says, he that would seek to be a great among you, he must be a servant of all. The son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give himself, you know, give his life a ransom for many. And he says, if anyone seeks to be great among you, he must be a servant. And that is the great, great theme of the New Testament. Those who are leaders in the local church are servants. And, uh, and those, whether they be deacons or elders or uh, Bible teachers, whatever role they have, are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it speaks about saints, and then it speaks about elders, and it speaks about deacons. What does the New Testament say about church leadership? I think this is so, so important. 
It has been said, and I believe it's very true, it is said that a church will not rise any higher than its leadership. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Now, there will be those within a local church that may outshine some of the leadership, but a, a local church as itself will not rise probably higher than the moral, uh, the moral standing and the godliness and the holiness and the spiritual uh, qualities of its leadership. And so we have, we have in this passage, he says that as he writes to this New Testament church, he writes to them and he writes to their elders and their deacons. A couple of key things uh, that we can say um, about, uh, about the New Testament leadership. Um, there are three different terms in the scriptures that speak to the idea of leadership in the local church about the elders. And those terms are overseers, elders, and shepherds. 47 times those terms are used in the New Testament. And there's other times that they're referred to. 47 times, it must be a very important thing as we think about the leadership of the local church. But every time we, we see this term, we see it in, in, in a plural. But before we look at that, just let me look at this for a minute with you. Uh, what is the difference between some of these things? What is the difference between deacons? What is the difference between elders? What is the difference between what the New Testament uh, epistles and the Apostle Paul say are ministers? Paul says he is a minister. Um, he speaks about Timothy as a minister. He speaks about Apollos as a minister. So there are, are three different areas. First of all, elders, they lead the local church in the spiritual sphere. And uh, they lead in, the, in, a, in, in a local church where they find themselves in fellowship. But we find that elders are made by the Holy Spirit. We read, that, we read of that in chapter 20 and verse 28 of the book of Acts. He speaks about, he says, feed the flock of God over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers by which he is purchased by his own blood, <clears throat> which God has purchased by the blood of his own son. And so we see that, holy, that, that elders are made overseers or made elders by the Holy Spirit. And so we in the local church, the language that we use is that we recognize those who the Lord has raised up as elders and overseers in the local church. And this is a tremendous thing because every church needs leadership. It's a sad thing, I think, that many small churches, small evangelical churches, if they're not large enough, if they're not large enough, they won't be able to afford a pastor to come and lead them. But every church, wherever it is, it may be in Africa, it may be in South America, it may be in a small rural area, it may be in a very remote area, every, but God has ensured that every local church, he would raise up leaders in that local church. They don't have to be large enough to afford to pay for a full-time minister to come in, but God in his foresight and through the Holy Spirit, he makes overseers, he makes elders to lead and guide in those local churches. When we think of the, um, the letter of, of uh, Paul to Titus, uh, Titus is to go and to recognize, uh, is going to appoint overseers and elders in small churches, in small churches in, uh, in Crete. These are very small churches, as, as we would think of small, and, uh, but they have leaders. God has ensured that small Philippi was a small gathering of believers. Many of the New Testament churches were small, but nearly all of them, as we read about them, they had leaders, they had elders. Either the Apostle Paul appointed them, the Holy Spirit raised them up, but they, they were ensured that they had leaders. And what a tremendous thing that the New Testament teaches that leaders are raised up by the Holy Spirit it's not up to the church to afford a leader, be able to pay for a leader to lead them. 
that the Holy Spirit has raised up leaders to guide them. Uh, deacons serve in the local church. They serve in a temporal sphere, and they, um, they are appointed by the church, and we see that in Acts chapter, chapter 6. Then you have ministers, and they teach and preach. Sometimes they have a teaching ministry within a local church. Sometimes they have a wider ministry in a universal church, uh, and they teach the Word of God, whether it be the Apostle Paul or Barnabas or Apollos or uh, many of these great leaders that are called ministers uh, in the New Testament, and they're called of God. They're not made by the Holy Spirit. They're called by God. They're empowered by the Holy Spirit. They look to God for their financial, uh, for, for their financial needs. They look to God for, for guidance and direction. One occasion in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul says about Apollos, he says, I asked him to come to you. But then he says this, and he will come to you when it is, when God would lead him, when it's appropriate. He says, I asked him to go to you, but it's God who's going to lead him and direct him in his ministry. And so you see those called by God. It's interesting that overseers, elders, and shepherds, whenever you see this term, they're almost always interchangeable. Notice uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 17, and Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I have the verse in the overhead, or you can look at it in your, in your Bibles. It says, he called for the elders. He's speaking to the same group of people. He says, be in your guard. And guard yourselves or watch your watch to yourselves and all the flock of God over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. So we see, see these three terms, elders, overseers, shepherd the church of God. When we come to Titus chapter 1 and verse 5 and verse 7, he says, appoint elders in every city. He says, then he says, for overseers should be above reproach. Overseers are to look to the finan the, are to look to the spiritual needs uh, of a local church. That's their role, ruling and overseeing. Elder speaks to the spiritual maturity of those men who do that work. And shepherding speaks about the work that they do, that they are to care for the flock, they to teach the flock and feed the flock and, and protect the flock from error and false teachers and, and false apostles. So we see these, we see these three terms are interchangeable. We see they're plural as well. In Acts chapter 20, he calls the elders of the church, elders of the, the assembly that was in Ephesus. We see in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5 and 7, he appointed elders in every city, in every assembly, to be overseers, to be above reproach. It's an interesting thing. That when there's a single, when there's a single uh, leader within a church, the pressure is very, very difficult. The pressure to be a full-time worker is difficult. I went to seminary. I didn't graduate seminary, but I did attend seminary. I, I, I attended Alliance Theological Seminary in Nyack, New York, not very far from Yonkers. And... Um, I have a number of friends who graduated from there in the ministry. I have some uh, that have leadership positions in the Christian Missionary Alliance Church. And it's interesting talking to them. It's interesting to read literature about the, uh, the difficulties and the struggles uh, of, of the pastoral work. And this, uh, this number, of, number of points that I have in this, in this slide comes from focus on the family and uh, some studies and, and surveys that they have done. 94% have pressure to have an ideal family. 90% say that the pastoral ministry affects their lives, their family negatively. 70% do not have someone they consider a close friend. Those within a local church, those who are leading in a local church, 80% are discouraged and deal with depression. 33% consider leaving their position this past year. Every uh, 1,400 ministers, all denominations are fired or forced to retire. 
the average length of a pasture has declined from seven years to four years. You can see the pressure and the difficulty of a single, the single pasture. And we, we don't find that in scripture. We always find a plurality. And I think that's a very important thing to share the work of God. To, 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 to carry the burden of all the work that goes on in a local church is a very difficult thing. Now, there's some that are very gifted and very successful in doing that kind of thing. But we don't read about the many, many who struggle over the, the difficulties and the struggles of being a single pastor in a local church. I thank God that he's given us a great pattern uh, of elders and deacons and ministers and uh, that labor and work within the local church. Look with me down at verse 5. Paul says of this group of believers, he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. He says, always in every prayer of mine for you, making requests with joy. Then he says in verse 5, I'm going to direct your attention to verse 5 of chapter 1. It says this, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. He says, I give you thanks and make prayer for you. He said, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I want to ask you, what does this verse mean? You may have read it before. You may have, you may have heard men preach upon it. You may have studied it. I want to address your attention to it. Sometimes it's said that it is speaking to the fellowship uh, in the idea of financial gifts that were given uh, by the Philippian church to the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul did receive financial gifts, and they share with him that kind of fellowship, but I'm not sure that's the idea here in this passage. I think of this passage when it says, right, he says, I, I make, I'm always praying for you. I thank God for you, every remembrance for you, and for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. It's very noted, it should be noted that in this first chapter, six times the word gospel is used. Just look with me for a moment at verse 27. It's mentioned twice. Only let your conduct be as it becomes the gospel. Twice in verse 27, at the near the end, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We find it in verse 12, which we'll look at next week for the furtherance of the gospel, in verse 17, for the defense of the gospel, and then on two occasions, or three occasions, he speaks about preaching Christ in the context of, of the gospel. So nine times in chapter one, he's speaking about the gospel. And I want to, I want to suggest to you, and I, I want to um, take you through a number of verses in the book of Philippians, and I want to suggest to you that Paul was a part of a gospel team, a ministry team. And he labored with a group of people. And as he labored together, he, he says in verse 5, I thank God for the fellowship of you in the gospel from the first day, from the very early days that I got to uh, ministry in Philippi. And even now, the ministry is continuing to go on uh, in the Lord. I think there's a gospel team. Look with me at a couple of verses we have in this, uh, in this book of Philippians. We looked at verse 1 already. Look at verse 114. And many of the brethren in the Lord, becoming confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. I want to think that these many brothers in the Lord, these are those who are part of his gospel team those he began to disciple, those he mentored, those he brought into the work, those he taught how to preach the gospel. He says in verse 27, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In chapter 2, in verse 22, he speaks about Epaphroditus. And this is a man who came out of a pagan background. Epaphroditus 
in the middle of his name, you can see the word Aphrodite. It is believed that his parents were those who, uh, who were from a pagan background, worshipped in the temples of Aphrodite, and named himself and devoted his son uh, to the protection of Aphrodite. But he came into contact with the Apostle Paul, and he came... And he got saved by the, by, the, uh, by the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord saved him. And the Lord began to use him in the gospel. And so he says of Epaphroditus, he says, and you know proof of him. He's a son of a father. He says, he has served with me in the gospel. So Epaphroditus served. He's with him in Rome now, but he served with him when he was in Philippi. We find also in chapter uh, in uh, chapter 2, in verse 25, he says, Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, in the work of Christ. Uh, look, look with me also in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 3, he says, I treat, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. This person has not given a name, it's probably Epaphroditus. But he says, also those women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with my other fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So the apostle Paul had, had this team of workers that he labored with. He preached the gospel in the open air. He preached the gospel and labored with him in the gospel. He had a, he had a team together and they labored together. There's something good about being together in a team. There's an African proverb. Uh, you probably have heard it before. It's a fairly well-known proverb. It says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. I think this whole idea of a group of leaders, a group of elders, a group of those who labor in the work of God, I think this is very, very important. Is important. You can't do very much with one person. One, can you think of any work that you do in the local church that only one person does that? When you work in vacation Bible school, you have a whole team of people working together. Can you imagine uh, having a vacation Bible school with 50 or 60 or 70 kids and having only one person doing all the work? It would be impossible. Can you imagine having an outreach of some, some sort and having only one person do all the work? Whatever it may be within the local church, we need a team of people working together. And I think that the Apostle Paul had that. The church of Philippi, there was, we know that Timothy was there for a period of time. We know Luke was there from Acts chapter 16. Of course, Epaphroditus was there. Clement was there. Syntyche and Euodia was there. It may have been that Lydia was there also. It may have been that the, the Philippian jailer and those in the family of the Philippian jailer was there also. And then when you come to chapter four, we find and many workers also. A great team of people working together. We need that. We need to have that kind of team together, working together as we serve the Lord. One impresses upon us, one person cannot do the work. We need many people. And we read about that. God has given many gifts to the local church in the, in, 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 in the lives of all the believers. We each have a gift. Some are teachers, some are helpers, some show, show uh, 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 hospitality to others. I'm not sure what each of these different workers did. Some were preachers, some were helpers. It says Syntyche and Yodia, they were laborers and helpers uh, in the work. But we see there was a team. And teams are very important. I'm going to read a quotation a little bit to you from John Hamblin, the John Hamblin gospel team. In the 1850s to the 1880s, it is said, secondly, to D.L. Moody coming to England and ministering and preaching, and C.H. Spurgeon, this gospel team, this group of believers from an assembly brethren background, they were had a great powerful effect. They won more people to the Lord uh, in those days um, 
than so many others. They worked as a team. Billy Graham had a, a team. T.E. Wilson, Grady Wilson, and George Beverly Shea, and Cleef Barrows, and Billy Graham, and many others were part of his gospel team. Operation Mobilization began to incorporate this idea of a gospel team. I have, I have some friends here in the uh, Florida, Tampa area from an Indian background, and they speak of how teams of Indian believers would go out into rural areas and other areas, and they would work as a team sharing the gospel. I know some believers in the area of Florida that are from a Caribbean background, and in Jamaica and some of the islands of the Caribbean, uh, many gospel teams were, were raised up uh, to bring the gospel to rural areas and in the cities of Kingston and other places. Gospel teams are important. Why? Why gospel teams? And I know, I know most assemblies work in teams. You have to. Uh, we need each other. And to do any work within the local church, uh, whether it be camp work, whether it be a vacation Bible school work, whether it be youth work, whether it be a retreat. We just had a, a, a retreat for uh, older high school and college age. Uh, we probably had 25 helpers. We had cooks and leaders and staff and those doing registration and those cleaning up and, and those teaching and doing seminars. We needed a whole team of people to do that kind of work. Well, why gospel teams? I want to suggest that they're more productive. More workers mean more people, I believe, coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Iron sharpens iron. Proverbs 27, 17. I believe that these workers will challenge and will, uh, will sharpen one another as we labor along in the work together. One gift complements another gift. One person's talents complements another talents. One person's vision complements another person's energy and desire to serve. Mentoring takes place in a gospel team. Mentoring takes place in, uh, in the eldership. Older, older experienced mature believers help younger, uh, younger believers as they labor together in an eldership and within the local assembly. Fellowship and mutual encouragement. We need encouragement. One person going out to the mission field laboring alone by himself is a very difficult thing. We need encouragement. We need the encouragement of a number of workers. When I was in Belgium, every two weeks, all the workers, all of the workers in Belgium, and there weren't that many, but about 10 uh, with, with wives, there were about 10 of us, five different uh, workers and their, and, and their wives would get together. We spent a whole morning in prayer uh, in Antwerp. We was a, a central location. We needed that mutual fellowship and encouragement and talking about the work. Spiritual vision, prayer power. It is said more prayer, more power, more people praying, more accountability. But I know my time is finished. I just want to close with leaving you with a quotation. It's a quotation from a, a book by John Hamblin. It's available on the internet. So if you just Google buds, blossoms, and fruits of revival, you'll get a couple of um, sources for this excellent book. It's about 125 pages, and it's thrilling uh, reading. John Hamblin was an actor, and he spent time in the United States. He came back to Liverpool, England, and God laid hold of him, and he got saved. And he began to preach the gospel. He was mentored, and uh, others began to join with him. Um, but allow me to, to read uh, this, this quotation uh, by him. And I think it's a very, very encouraging uh, thing to see uh, what he has to say. He said, the Lord was about to do a wonderful work in Liverpool. The Lord put it in my heart for a worker who could sing so that we in the open air that we might attract people <clears throat> to hear in all simplicity the glorious gospel. I soon met Edward Usher, an Irishman with a clear tenor voice. From that hour, souls were brought to God by the great stone, by the lamb, the lime lamppost as our general pulpit. Prayer meetings were held 
And after preaching, many came to Christ during those prayer times. Now notice this, he says, now a team of 12 men together, gather together to read and meditate upon the scriptures and each, and each astonished each other with their diverse talents, all helpful to one another. Some visiting the spiritual needy in the lanes and the alleys, some preaching in the cellars and under lamps and the power of God and the power of bless and the blessing of God were upon us, preaching every day in warehouses and in different parts of the town. And I just read that as we close our time tonight, I just read that to, to give you some encouragement. I love this passage to see various gifts, 12 men coming together, uh, John Hamlin and Edwin Usher, and eventually a, a, a little bit later, Harry Morehouse and others would come together and they would labor all through Manchester, all through Liverpool, all through that central, uh, central part of England and many, many came to faith in the Lord Jesus. Could that be done by one person? Could that be done by John Hamblin alone? He would have a certain amount of ability to reach souls, but look how much more they could do with 12 men with diverse talents and gifts, all helping one another, all doing different kinds of works, all going to different areas of the city. In this, in this book, he talks how they rented out uh, Sunday evenings in London. Now they rented out um, 12, 12 opera houses for Sunday nights. I think it was, I'm sorry, in Belfast, 12 opera houses uh, to preach the gospel. And so you just begin to see uh, how God works through these various efforts, how a team is very important. A team of elders, a team of deacons, a team of workers. And we see that uh, in, in, this, uh, in this wonderful little book of Philippians. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you for our time together. And we pray, Father, you would encourage us and other believers would encourage us as we get together in teams, whether it be an individual outreach, uh, like the Halloween outreach we've been, been hearing about, or a retreat, or a camp, or a vacation Bible school, or a gospel team, whatever it may be. Father, we thank you for uh, what you put in your scriptures, working together with various gifts and talents and abilities. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.